The year is 1997. I am 10 years old. John Major is about to lose a landslide election to Tony Blair, who will, in turn, bring about the demise of the British left. Brian Harvey just got sacked from East 17. And this little disc, comprised of a mostly polycarbonate plastic substrate, is about to change my life forever. I played hella games when I was a kid. Up until the age of about 15, gaming was my life. Homework? No thank you. Socializing? Hard pass. Developing critical thinking skills? I'm good. I played so many games as a kid that the vast majority of my core memories are various PS1 intros. But there's one game amongst the many that has a special place in my heart. Final Fantasy VII. Just gonna say right off the bat, my parents were getting a divorce when I was 10. So massively formative age, massively formative things happening in my life, and along comes something that, at will, transports me to a completely different world. All the ingredients are there for Final Fantasy VII to live rent-free in my head until I draw my very last breath. So granted, I may be wearing some slightly rose-tinted glasses when it comes to the original Final Fantasy VII. That said, I go back and play it maybe once every three or four years, and every single time, it surprises me how well it holds up. And I'm not quite sure why. I've played it maybe six times now, and every time I think about revisiting it, I have to work myself up to do it. Just in case, after all these years, it isn't as good as I remember it being. But it always is. Final Fantasy VII is amazing. There's been two times in my life when gaming has actually genuinely left me with my jaw on the floor. The first was when I walked up to a PS1 demo unit in Toys R Us, and my name was already on the player select screen before I'd even touched the pad. I told my mum that the future's here because this thing knows my name, only to have the bloke behind me tell me that that was his name too and he just finished playing. And the other time is when I played Final Fantasy VII, the longest, best game of my life, and thinking I'd wrap the story up by leaving Midgar, only to be presented with an entire world outside of the sprawling city I'd just spent my entire summer holiday in. Absolutely mind-blowing. A true core memory that brings me immeasurable joy to this day. Final Fantasy VII had these gorgeous pre-rendered backgrounds that really stood out at the time. PS1 games looked like shit, even back then. The jump from 2D games to 3D games was a weird one in that it was a bit of a regression in a way. I had a Mega Drive before I had a PS1, and Mega Drive games were big giant explosions of colour, high contrast palettes with amazing little details. And PS1 games, while 3D, especially initially, looked bad. It takes a lot more processing power to render polygons rather than sprites. So while you can really convey the sense of 3D space, most PS1 games couldn't afford to give their worlds and their inhabitants anything like the amount of character that you'd found in the last generation of consoles. I'm not trying to be a graphics hipster, I love my PS1. But 3D graphics didn't really get good until about halfway through the sixth generation of consoles. Final Fantasy VII's graphics were half and half. Shit, shit, shitty polygonal characters running around in achingly beautiful pre-rendered 2D worlds. I'd never seen anything like it. And it gave you this kind of otherworldly feeling. Like there was something off with the place. Sometimes you press left on the D-pad and because the devs didn't always get the perspective right, you didn't actually go left. Something else that just felt a bit off. It all added up to a bit of an ethereal experience that tied you into just how weird the story was. I've played this game many times. I've watched dozens of hours of video essays on it and spent many years reading about it online. And I still don't have a grasp on the plot. Now, I'm not saying it's particularly deep or even good. I really truly love it, but whenever I go to Wikipedia to read up on it from time to time, there's always something in the plot summary that catches me by surprise. It is insanely convoluted, and most of it makes zero sense. But there's something there. 
The weird Oedipal vibes between Sephiroth and Geneva. The talking fursuit. The eco-terrorist framing. The stilted love triangle between Cloud, Tifa and Ares. The homoerotic vibes between Cloud and Sephiroth. The homoerotic vibes between Cloud and Zack. The homoerotic vibes between Cloud and Barrett. You get the idea. There are hints of substance in the plot of the game. Between the boilerplate, poorly translated dialogue and the usual hero's journey fluff, there are little pockets of interest there if you're willing to find them. I'm not going to sit here and make wild claims like the writing in Final Fantasy VII was anywhere near approaching passable, but it spoke to me in the same way that Donnie Darko would later in life. It's super basic when you spend more than two seconds looking at it, but it's just weird enough to pull you in. I played Final Fantasy VII and lived and breathed it while I did. Complete and total immersion. It was easily the best game I'd ever played, unlike anything I'd ever experienced. And because it was so good, I played every other Final Fantasy up until 16 because I don't have a PS5. And I wish I didn't feel this way, but after experiencing the majesty of 7, each successive entry was a little more disappointing than the last. 8 was good, but school was way too emo and the junction system was kind of boring. 9 I didn't really gel with and the art direction was too cutesy for my tastes. Also, I lent my copy to a friend before I beat the final boss and he scratched the disc up so bad I couldn't finish it, so I'm taking points off of it for that. 10 was fun, but the dialogue and the plot were pretty much unbearable. 11 was an MMORPG, so fuck that. 12 was the first game to move away from turn-based combat and I will never forgive it for that. We don't need to talk about 13. 14 is another MMO, so fuck that. And I played 15 before they patched out the driving, so I spent the vast majority of the game watching the car drive itself while my boy band sat in absolute silence. Not great. So, what's going on? Is it just the case that Final Fantasy VII was my first experience with the series, and I played it at such an important age that I can't be objective about the rest of the series, because there's absolutely no way a new entry could ever live up to the unachievable pedestal that I put number 7 on? Mm, no. And here's why. Square doesn't know what to do with Final Fantasy VII. Let's look at the evidence. Final Fantasy VII came out in 1997. Advent Children came out in 2005. And in the eight years in between, Square had put out four Final Fantasy games. Five if you count 10-2, but that's an insane thing to do, so let's move on. Of the four mainline entries since VII, I enjoyed them all, but I wouldn't say that any one of them could hold a candle to it. I'd made my peace with the fact that nothing would ever live up to it. I was okay with that. So, you can imagine the state of my pants when I saw the first teaser for Advent Children. <laughs> to say my expectations were high would be criminally underselling the situation. I was beside myself, I couldn't contain it, I was insufferable to be around. And then it came out. And it sucked. It sucked so bad. And it's not like the warning signs weren't there. Massively convoluted, incredibly cringy dialogue, and an over-reliance on outrageous fight sequences that only exist to cover up the fact that Advent Children had absolutely nothing to say. Final Fantasy VII said things. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know what it said, but it said something. Seven, like Advent Children, was massively convoluted and riddled with cringe, but it didn't matter because firstly, you had the gameplay to distract you from its complete lack of depth. And secondly, as with all JRPGs, you spend so long playing them that they eventually exert some form of Stockholm Syndrome over you and win you round with sheer insistence over a period of 60 plus hours. Advent Children is a film. It has no interactivity for you to buy into. And it only lasts 101 minutes. So it doesn't have the time to force you to love it. Even if that hour and 40 minutes feels like a week and a half. Because it sucks. I had to rewatch it to write this script. You're welcome, by the way. I put myself through that for you. For YouTube. For art. I didn't play Dirge of Cerberus. Vincent might be my favorite character from the original, but even to a die-hard fan, this looked like a subpar take on the action shooter in a time absolutely swamped with subpar takes on the action shooter. I didn't have a PSP, and I wasn't going to buy one for the sake of one game. I wanted Crisis Core, but I didn't play it. Now, hold up, I've seen video essays, long plays, and let's plays about Crisis Core, so it's not like what I'm about to say is completely unfounded. 
And I know some people aren't going to like this, but Crisis Core was mid at best. At best. And after Advent Children, this was no surprise, but it very much signaled the end of my faith in Square. It's still Final Fantasy VII, but it's been Kingdom hearts Just like Advent Children, it's overly complicated in the plot whilst being paper thin. By adding so much to the story, they actually end up taken away from it. As with almost all fiction writing, when you have a big mysterious enemy, a lot of the joy in that enemy comes from the feeling of not knowing, from the mystery itself. So if you're ever planning on explaining that mystery, you'd better make the explanation itself impeccable. I can think of precisely one example where that was done well, and I can think of so many where it wasn't. And I count Final Fantasy's treatment of Sephiroth after the original game amongst those many failures. Sephiroth says about four words in the original. You don't even see him until the second disc. You only hear about him, about the damage he's done, how twisted he's become and what a threat he is. He looms over you the entire time whilst never coming into view. It's incredibly effective storytelling. He's terrifying and more importantly, he's interesting, precisely because you don't see him. It's a masterful demonstration of show don't tell. And in Crisis Core, Square was all, nah, we're gonna tell. We're gonna tell it all. Which, rather neatly, brings me on to the main event. Final Fantasy VII, the remake. <sighs> okay, let's start from the start. Square releases the greatest artistic achievement of all time in 1997. They go on to release many standalone entries in the series over the next couple of decades. During that time, Final Fantasy VII cements itself as a fan favorite, a cult classic, and earns itself a place in the pantheon of the best, most legendary epic gamer games. By the mid-2000s, the concept of the game remake barely existed and certainly didn't have the stranglehold it does on today's scene. But with the development of the compilation of Final Fantasy VII announced in 2005, fans started to suspect a remake was in the works. And Square, being the massive dickbags that they are, released a remastered version of the Final Fantasy VII intro sequence at E3. I was shook. I loved VII and had been disappointed with every addition to it. Graphically, the original game was looking pretty shoddy by that time, and all I wanted was a remake with a fresh coat of paint. But nothing came of it. It was a tech demo, the ultimate fake out. Downright inconsiderate if you ask me. Ten years pass, and I'd made my peace with the tech demo being the ultimate dick pull. It wasn't happening. It will never happen. There's no way they could make anything that the fans would ever be happy with. Square is a different company now. It's not happening. E3 2015. Holy fucking shit, it's happening. I'm gonna be a little candid here, but I, honest to God, got a bit of a lump in my throat when I saw the concept trailer. My eyes were moist. It looked beautiful. And it wasn't a remaster, it was a remake. It said it right there in the title. I genuinely couldn't believe it. Good things don't happen to me, but here I am, getting the impossible. I finally had a reason to exist on this shitbird planet. And then came the news. Turn-based combat is out. Dang. It'll be released in three installments. That's a bit money-grabby, but whatever. What's this now? It's not a remake, it's a reimagining. Fuck. The Final Fantasy VII Remake took five years to come out after it was announced, and every bit of new information in the run-up to the release was a dagger in my insufferably purest heart. Square's output had been fairly cack for over a decade. Well, maybe not cack, but middling at least. And as with almost all developers, the bigger they get, the more milk toast their output becomes. Because big companies are too big to fail, too big to be bold or take risks, too big to try new things. It's in their interest to play it increasingly safe the more money they accumulate. And Final Fantasy 13 and 15 were so middle of the road that they'd become bland. 13 was a 60 hour series of hauls followed by 10 hours in a bad open world. And 15 was the gaming equivalent of an Oasis tribute band playing a Weatherspoons in Bedfordshire in 2017. The point being that Final Fantasy 15 was dull and 7 Remake was looking more and more like 15. The action based combat the endless cringe fountain of emotive sighing. The 
grand sweeping story that's about as deep as a Ricky Gervais joke. Okay, right. That was irony. Now, that was to be expected. That I could live with. I saw that coming. I don't like modern Final Fantasy. It's not for me, and that's okay. It might be for you, and that's okay too. We can both like different things and still be buds, I promise. I would have enjoyed the game if it was just the original with better graphics and worse dialogue for the sake of expanding on the original premise. I wouldn't have ever loved it, but I would have played it and been okay with it. But they came for the combat. My beloved ATB. If you didn't play the original, ATB stands for Active Time Battle. Basically, your three guys have a little gauge. And when that gauge fills up, one of your guys can do a thing. You're not actively controlling your characters. You're taking command of them. Turn-based combat outside of tactical games didn't really exist in RPGs in 2020. Final Fantasy stuck with turn-based combat up until FF12, and I miss it. It was the one thing I had to look forward to with the remake. And they swapped it out for the same boring shit every other half-baked action combat game has nowadays. And I understand why. Turn-based combat is old-fashioned. This is a big, flashy, flagship title, and it needs new and exciting gameplay to hook people in. Nobody wants turn-based combat anymore. It'd be boring and it wouldn't sell. True say, but allow me to counter with... Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth has turn-based combat, and it's amazing. You're right, turn-based combat is old-fashioned, but this isn't. Like a Dragon takes a tired old concept and gives it a bit of love, an amazing new take on a formula that innovates and captivates. If Square knew what they were doing with Final Fantasy VII, if they gave it the love and the thought it deserves, this is what they could have done. Instead of discarding the old combat system in favour of something more modern, they could have innovated it and made it stand out in a time where turn-based combat is largely forgotten. To me, it shows that Final Fantasy VII isn't a labour of love to Square. It's a finely crafted machine designed to extract the most amount of money from as many people as it can. Which is most evidenced, I think, by the fact that the remake is split over three releases. I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't play the remake until I decided to make this video. But I finally bought it, expectations completely on the floor. And I was not prepared for just how dull the remake is. The padding. Everything is so drawn out. So many sequences that go on way too long where you're pretty much just holding forward on the D-pad. This adds absolutely nothing to my experience and only serves to frustrate me and break my immersion. And the side quests and detours? Prolonged way past the point of sanity. This remake in no way, shape or form needed to be spread across three releases. Cut all this shit out and it would have been an objectively better game. It's almost staggeringly obvious that Square is doing everything it can to long this out over three games and keep the cash cow alive before people figure it out and lose interest. They gave the Final Fantasy VII remake the Hobbit treatment. It's disappointing, but not surprising. What was surprising was the Final Fantasy VII Battle Royale. I thought Square had really taken the low road with this whole thing, but this is just insulting. And yet, Square managed to get one more not shot in with Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis. After the disappointment of the remake and everything that followed, Square threw us purists a bone in the form of a free mobile game that let you play out the key scenes from the original while retaining a turn-based battle system. It wasn't what I wanted, but at this point, I'd happily take it. And it's a gacha game. A cheap, quick cash-in with predatory monetization systems. Fuck's sake. Yet more evidence that Square are no longer capable of treating Final Fantasy VII with the dignity it deserves. When all said and done, if you enjoyed the remake and the spin-offs it spawned, if you like the changes to the plot and the new battle system, fair enough. For me, it was a bloated, half assed attempt at cashing in on something very close to my heart. And it could have been so much more. Final Fantasy's output has been on the slide for a while. Every entry since 10 has edged a little closer to homogeneity. And unfortunately for me, the window of time where a Final Fantasy VII remake was commercially viable for Square is when Square are where they are right now, at their most miserly. But let's be real, I haven't got a leg to stand on. The game sold well, was generally well received, and has scores of people that absolutely loved it. And I'm clearly wearing some heavily rose-tinted glasses, so anything less than a complete carbon copy would have left me disappointed. There's no universe that exists in which I could have been fair about this game, or any other Final Fantasy for that matter. And with that in mind, 
They say that the best Final Fantasy is whichever one you played first. And you know what? They're right. Because my first Final Fantasy was Final Fantasy VII, which is objectively the best one. I will not be taking questions. Thanks for watching.